So in the third module, so here our main goal is trying to understand what to determine the fluctuation of y, right? So remember the equation I wrote. So let me just repeat the equation. So we have this equation y. So we wrote the equation y equal to c as a function of y and potentially i as a function of y. From this one equation, we can determine y, right? And certainly if there's any disturbance, meaning so there's any shock to c or i, what happened? So y is gonna change. So that's explained. So what determine y? But before I move further, a very important thing is I want to highlight. And in this part of the lecture, including loss class and this class. So we are uh, demand side. What this means, means everything is gonna be determined by demand. But as a matter of fact, this is not always true. And if you think about 2020, so I'm going, so this is going to, this is going to make, make sense just in a few slides, okay? So here, everything is going to be determined by demand. But in reality, it could be determined by supply. Okay, it's so like 2020. You have money. You want to buy. Can you buy? There are many things you cannot get, right? So if you ever have experience to try to get a hold of a GPU, or if you have any have experience, your par if par parents or your family want to get a car, you know what that means, do you? But here, but here we focus on demand, meaning, okay, so the buyer is gonna decide. If I want to buy, there's available. If I don't, if I don't, so the money is me. But in 2020 or occasionally happened in history, like in 1970, that's not the case. You have the money, you not necessarily get what you want, but that's not our focus. Here, our focus, we focus on the demand side. That's, that's something you need to keep in mind. That's very important, all right? You can say this, there's some limitation of the, of the, of the, of the theory or the, of the story. But however, so we start from something simple. Keep that in mind, okay? So, but I will emphasize this again, okay? Right, so in the last class or in the previous lecture, we have studied what determines Y, sorry, what determines C. Right, we loosely talk about I. Now we're going to bring them together again. So essentially, we're going to bring this in this equation to see how it determines how Y is determined. Right, and the, this lecture, so we're going to look at two things. Number one, inventory adjustment. But this inventory adjustment essentially is going to kind of is kind of solve this equation basically. Okay, when I say solve the equation, essentially it's like how our economy to arrive a particular y. Number two, we are going to see why investment spending is a leading indicator. Okay, so that's that's the um, that's the main topic of this lecture. So in, in this lecture, so basically we are going to study an income expenditure model. Okay, so we are looking at demand side. By the way, look at here expenditure, meaning we look at the demand side. So the key here is inventory, is inventory. But what is inventory? Let's just use this background picture, right? So this is like typical car dealership, right? So they have a car. But first of all, why they have a car in their garage or in their parking lots as a dealership? Why? Why they need to have a car there? Why they have a car waiting for you? Isn't that very costly to have a car sitting there, but why they have a car there? Just, just use your common sense. Something. Just sell, right? Just make it convenient. Just, just make the deal go through, right? So they need inventory. Yes, it is expensive to keep the car in the garage or in their parking lots, but this is a necessary to what? To kind of either do advertisement or to satisfy the need for the customer, right? So this is a starting point. You need inventory, 
Otherwise, you walk to a car dealership. So they told you, okay, wait, so we are going to deliver a car. And you're probably going to walk away to other dealer, whoever have, in, have a car in stock, right? So this is like human nature. Very good search point. Now, inventory, what is the optimal amount to keep in your garage? Again, use a common sense. Is more the better? No. Is less better? Neither, right? So there's a right amount. Very good. So there's a certain amount, okay? This is number two. Number three, just imagine a car dealership. So do they need to bring you a car on a regular basis or no? You, you should get why? Like I'm saying, so do they need to bring new cars like every month or every, every huh? Assuming that's all the cars that they had in stock. But that's the that, that's point, right? So let me give you an example, okay? So there's a Honda in 144. I know, does anyone know there's Honda, right? So if you look at there, they have, they have a flyer, what they say? We have new car comes in every day. So certainly this is a, this advertisement, they are trying to attract you to come to see their new car, right? But anyway, so just think about, so in reality, again, so this is using common sense. Car dealership, okay, the same question. So we understand they need to have inventory and that there's a certain amount of inventory. Then so my third question is, do they need to bring new cars on a regular basis or not? That's my question. So you still don't think they don't need. But as a matter of fact, yes, they do. Just give you numbers to understand what this means, right? Okay. So for example, you have a car dealership. Okay, so they start with 10 car in their inventory. Okay, and then there are two scenarios. Scenario number one, as you say, they don't need to bring car. Okay, so in a year, let's just, just make it simple. Okay? In one year, you say they don't need to bring any new car. And then, so in this year, I don't know. So this is a question mark. Actually, that's, that's the discussion we are going to immediately follow. So how many are you going to sell? So if you know, they sell 10 cars. How many cars they have at the end of the year? Zero. And then, so at the beginning of the next year, does that sound like a good business model? No. On the other hand, so in one year, let's just simplify. Every month, they bring in one new car, one per month. All right, and then follow the same example. So for example, they sold 10 cars. What happened at the beginning of the next year? How many cars they have? Huh? 12. Okay, before I talk about the, what is optimal strategy, let me just, tell, let, me just let, let, let you tell me which one do you think is better? The top one or the bottom one? The bottom one, right? So now they just answer the question I just asked you. So usually they are going to bring car on a regular basis. Why? Because the demand come in on a regular basis. So that makes sense now. This is true not only for car dealership. You go to any grocery store. So they all, so they have a door for delivery. What that? What is that? So that just what? That just refill for the inventory. Does that make sense? Okay. So now those just realize this is probably not what we are interested in. Now for us, now what we're interested in is the following. Now we agree. So this is this is probably usually most business do, right? Yes or no? Okay. So now here, so but in reality, so yes, this is what this is their decision, like how many cars they bring in every month or every quarter. Okay, so this is something they can choose. But in reality, do you think this is something they know upfront? No, right? So this, this is something out of their control. The only thing they control is the following. So number one, how many cars they bring in, okay? And certainly how many cars they bring in is based on expectation, right? Are you with me? So you understand what does the expectation means? 
It's like, okay, they're expecting, so the demand is strong. They are gonna bring more car, right? But toward the end, you don't need to go that far. Like at the end of the year, so they're gonna see their inventory. Now in this case, they bring in one per month. They start with 10. They sold 12, uh, sold 10. They end up with 12 at the end of the year. So now this number is gonna tell a signal. Okay, use your common sense. If you are the owner of a car dealership, what does that mean to you? Just look at this example. You start with 10. Now we understand why you need to keep 10, right? And furthermore, you understand so why you need to bring car every month or every quarter, right? And the third, so we understand. So this 10 is out of your control. I mean, this 10 sales out of your control. Yes, you can do something, right? So you can have your, your uh, um, salesman to be more aggressive, but still, so there's the limit you can do, right? Okay, so now the last thing is, so when the tail, you start with 10. What does that mean to you? What are you gonna do? So there are two questions. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? You over, you just over order inventory. But, but then it's so a transit in the language more appropriate to our context. That just means what? So the business or the supply side overestimate the demand. Why order so much? Because you are expecting the demand is high. Now the reality is, so the demand is not as you expected. You overestimate the demand. Remember this, remember where I start, right? So we said, all we use is focus on demand side. There's no issue to produce. But in reality, particularly look at 2020, there's an issue with supply. Let's just, let's just set aside the supply side for a moment, all right? Is, are you with me? Okay, very good. So you understand, so in this case, you overestimate demand. Now, what are you gonna do next day? So there are two questions, right? So first you realize, okay, I overestimate. Now what are you gonna do? You are going to, there are three choices. You do what you used to do, like order one per mouse, or you order more or order less. What do you do? <coughs> you order less. So this is adjustment, right? Okay, so now we understand, okay? But then, so this adjustment, actually you're adjusting your inventory investment or in general, you adjust your investment. So this adjustment is going to determine, that's going to coming up, it's going to determine the level of GDP. Again, so we look at demand side, meaning so the level of total spending, okay? So that's what is gonna happen. Let's look at it here. So to summarize through this simple example, I show you inventory plays a central role because that's just gonna tell you as a signal. So whether you overestimate or underestimate, but certainly this overestimate and underestimate essentially or fundamentally coming from what? Coming from the demand. When we say overestimate, essentially it's because the demand is below your expectation. When we say we underestimate, it means the demand exceeds your expectation, right? So fundamentally, so the story comes from the demand. Okay. <clears throat> now, so before, further, before I go to the detail of, the, of this model, like income expansion model, <clears throat> I wanna highlight that there are a few assumptions we make. Number one, so essentially that just says is demand driven. So there, there's no problem to produce, but again, 2020 told us a different scenario. But you may wondering why we don't look at that particular scenario. There are two reasons. Number one, if we look at the data, if we look at the data in the history, most of the time, most of the time, so usually, so we have, you have a, <clears throat> 
shock from demand side. Occasion or rarely something happened in 2020. Okay, so what's very rare, okay, that's number one. Number two, number two. So this supply side, so the discussion is a bit more involved. So that's why we start with simple. There are two reasons to summarize. One is, so the demand driven is more common. And the number two, so demand driven is easier to understand. So we, that's why this is principal class. Okay, this, <clears throat> this is the first assumption. Second assumption, interest rate is fixed. So you change the price of fixed. <coughs> Third and fourth assumption, essentially there's no G, there's no net export. All right, so we're gonna relax that later. So now with this, and then so we have, first we have this equation. <coughs> it's because G, equal to zero and nx equal to zero, okay? Now, the second equation, so let me write down. So the first equation is coming from looking at GDP through the lens of expenditure. Second equation coming from looking at the GDP through the lens of income. All right. Okay, and then so we have this consumption function we have discussed in previous lecture, okay? And then for now, let's assume I planned it is fixed, meaning so it's a, it's a constant with respect to Y. So we all end up with the last equation. AE is aggregate, is planned aggregate expenditure equal to C plus I plan. So essentially, so this is how the economy is planned to spend. It's planned to spend. Right, this is where we start. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look at this table to understand what this means. We start with first column, real GDP. And then, so the second column, y d equal to real GDP, this is coming from income approach, right? How much you produce, translate how much income you have. Now, what we have in the third column, that's coming from here. When income equals zero, you are going to consume 300, right? So this gives you about this constant. Right, and then when income, look at here, when income increase from zero to 500, or maybe goes to the third line is easier, zero to 1,000. You have MPC of 0 0.6, and your consumption will increase by 600. So that's exactly what happened. Right, so it's coming from <clears throat> 0.6. Now next one is planned. I plan, okay? For the moment, we assume these are fixed. All right? So now, <coughs> <coughs> now let's look at the last column. The last column equal to the summation of these two, right? So let's look at another example, 900, 500, 400, all right? Okay, so, but if you look at, so first, this is how we end up with this table. Now, if you look at this table, there's only one row. There's only one row, these two, equal to this, okay? What this means? First of all, this means we are in the equilibrium. All right, 
And but this equilibrium essentially just determines GDP. This is number one. Number two, to understand why this is equilibrium, let's see what happens if we are not in this rule. Right, then there are two possibilities, right? So either you above, I mean, in terms of this table, you above or below, right? Are you with me? So there are only two possibilities. Now let's look at what happened if you above. Let's just pick a random row. Let's just look at it here. Okay, let's look at this row. So if we are in this row, what does this mean? This just means, so one way to explain the story is, this just means, so first, first, the economy produced 1,000. So this immediately means income equal to, what's the income? Can anyone tell me? If, if the production, if the real GDP is 1,000, what is going to be the income? The income of the, of the households. I'm sorry? Yes, it's 1,000, why? Right, exactly. So you produce 1,000, and then so the terms of income is going to be 1,000. Right. So now with 1,000 of income, can anyone tell me, so how much you're going to spend? Look at this table and, and what that means. How much is it going to spend? 900. 900. And why end up with 900? Because so there, your consumption behavior is described by this function, right? And in the last lecture, we have a look at the US data for a particular year and over time. This function prescribe how people behave almost perfectly. With 1,000 income, you're gonna spend 900. Not only spend 900, you're also is gonna have 500 of investment. So that just means the total expenditure is gonna be 1,400. Now there's a problem. What's the problem? We produce 1,000. But what's the demand? What's the actual demand? 1,400. What does that mean in the market? There's not enough, there's a shortage, right? And then, so just link to the earlier example we, 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 we look at, meaning your inventory is going to be low or high? Very low, very, very low. Right? And then, so what are you going to do as the next step? You want to produce more or produce less? More, right? So meaning, so you're going to move, move down. <clears throat> now go to the, the another case, you below this line. So if you can look at it here, look at this row. And then, so the opposite is going to happen. You produce 3,000, which in here actually translates in $3 trillion of goods. You have an income of 3,000. You spend 2.1 trillion. Investment is five. And with the total demand is 2.6 trillion. Now opposite happen. Your inventory start to pile up. Again, so to link to an earlier example, show you meaning. So you have lots of car you cannot sell, and then so you're going to tell the manufacturer slow down. Meaning you're going to move to this direction, right? Until we hit this magic number, right? But then, so let's just kind of. Let's kind of look at this from a bird's, bird's eye view, or just, just let's just try to jump out of our discussion. 
the one things I've kind of given to you is I said, okay, so the economy start to produce something. But just think about what that means. Literally means like in reality, literally means, so for the business, I mean, any business, really they don't know, really they don't know how much to produce at the beginning of the year. They only have a projection. You ask any business, right? So I don't know, again, so does anyone have a job? I need a volunteer. Anyone have a job? Yeah, what do you do? Tax intern. I'm sorry? Tax intern. Oh, you have a tax intern. Uh, but so before the tax season, I guess in your firm, so you have some projection regarding to how many customers you have, right? And that's gonna determine how many interns they're gonna hire, no? And furthermore, they also is gonna determine like how many office supply they're gonna get, right? So do they really know how many customers they're gonna have? No, right? So in this example, even this is a little bit harder. Actually, this example is actually harder to explain. But still, so from here you can see, so they really don't know how, how many reports, sorry, how many tax return they are going to, they are, they are going to work out, right? This is, this, this is true for every business. This is true for every business that just means, okay, so in our example, it just means, so we really don't know which role are you in. But then, so this is like guess and verify. Meaning, so if you guess, your guess is very optimistic, and then so the market is going to give you a hammer. Like in his case, so if, if your firm, if your owner, was very optimistic, and then they hire lots of inter or hire lots of accountant. And then what happens? So they're going to lose some profit, right? So they're going to, uh, in this case, they're going to push up. On the other hand, so if, like, okay, so use your example, if they underestimate, at the end of before the last week of, <clears throat> or the last month, they're probably going to scramble to get some accountant to fill the job, right? So that's happens. That's what happens in aggregate, aggregate, aggregate economy. We don't know what the number is going to settle, but this is like gates and verify. This is gates and verify. But eventually, eventually, so the economy is going to settle in one particular row. Okay? So maybe we can look at this through a through a graph. So we start with consumption function. So this consumption function is coming from here in the middle, right? This, this consumption function. Okay, consumption function. Now we are going to add investment. So essentially it's gonna move this off because this investment is, is independent of the, of, of, of your income, right? Okay, so now we have accurate expenditure. Now, so by the way, so I, I already explained to you what happens, right? So this, uh, this, uh, this is based on this table. Now there are two scenarios, either, let me go, go to here, sorry. Uh, apology, okay. So, yeah, so this, this is what I want to show you. Right, so only at one point, only at one point, which is here, that's what we discussed in the previous slide. Only here, we are in Guadalupe. But away from this point, there are two possibilities. Either, either you produce too much or you have been too optimistic, right? Now what happened in this case? So there's a gap. The gap between this 45 degree line, by the way, this 45 degree line, essentially you can interpret this, how much you produce, all right? But now here, there's a gap, a gap between this 45 degree line and, and the aggregate expenditure. So this unplanned, this unplanned investment. So literally that just means there are things you cannot sell as quick as, as you plan. Right, so there are unplanned 
investment increase is positive. So that sends a signal, you have been too optimistic. And then you're going to adjust by reduce your production. On the other hand, if you go to the left hand side, if you here, if we go to here, and then so your demand exceed what you produce. The unplanned inventory investment is gonna be negative, meaning so you're gonna run it out of your inventory. <clears throat> so that's gonna send a different signal. So you haven't produced enough. <clears throat> so eventually you settle in the middle, we call it Keynes in cross. And so that's the essential, that's the equilibrium. All right. So now let's go back to a few slides we skip. I did not necessarily follow the slides, okay? But I just kind of blend the discussion with the slides. Let's go back, okay? Sorry. Yeah, so this is actually expenditure function, right? So we already discussed. And except this line, sorry, except this row, except this row, <coughs> real GDP is different from aggregate expenditure planned. Okay. Now let's see what happens. Okay, so planned aggregate expenditure, it could, it can differ from real GDP again, because what's the real GDP is kind of everyone's guess, right? It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be a guess and verify again, right? But this is going to, this is going to happen. This is going to adjust through through this number. Okay. There are two scenarios. If firm have overestimate sale, they produce too much. And then there's a, this is gonna be unintended addition to inventory or you have inventory to pile up. And this I planned it will be positive. Okay, just think about, so you order too much car, too many cars every month, you cannot sell. On the other hand, so you may underestimate sale. And then, so the plan I, sorry, unplanned I will be negative. You cannot keep up with the demand. Okay, there are only two possibilities. Now let's look at this example to understand. So this unplanned inventory investment. Suppose the level of planned accurate expenditure is 500 and the real GDP is 600. So essentially ask you, what happened to inventory investment? You have more inventory or less inventory? So look at these two numbers. You produce too much or produce too little? You produce too much. So if you produce too much, oh, thank you. So you produce too much. So what that means in terms of inventory, they start to increase, right? It's unplanned inventory is increasing. Actually the, the number of unplanned inventory investment is uh, 100. All right, so we can look at this equation a little bit more careful. So GDP equal to C plus I, but I has two components, planned plus unplanned. And then the first of two terms we call aggregate expenditure, planned. And the last term is called unplanned. So whenever there are two possibilities, right? So certainly, Certainly, if, if this GDP equal to planned aggregate expenditure, we are in equilibrium. It's like a guess and a verify guess. So you have the correct guess. There's no shock. Everything goes as planned. Just again, okay, so back to the original example of a car dealership. 
So you bring one car every month, you sell one car every month. All right, so everything just goes smooth. But in reality, it's different. So there is up and down, up and down, all right? Hence, there are two possibilities. If GDP is greater than this number, must mean this is positive. Actually, this means you produce too much. You have inventory investment increase, and this is positive. Alternative, the GDP is less than aggregate expenditure. You produce too little, and this is a negative. All right, so there are two scenarios. And the business is going to adjust accordingly. Again, okay, so I want to emphasize the demand side I mentioned earlier. Here, everything is going to be driven by demand side. The supply side, they have the flexibility. They have the capacity to adjust. But if you look at 2020, that's different. Even though demand was very strong for many electronics, cars. But unfortunately, that's the time the manufacturer cannot keep up with demand. All right? But again, so in this scenario, or in most of the time, so the economy is determined by demand side. But sometimes, sometimes it's determined by the supply side. <clears throat> All right, so we summarize, we say the economy is in the income expenditure equilibrium when aggregate output equal to planned aggregate expenditure. Or to, or to write down, let's just say this right here, Y equal to AE planned. All right, you produce as you plan and you consume as you plan. There's no surprise. There's no surprise. Right? <clears throat> and that actually goes to here. So that's something I just showed you earlier, right? But again, there are two possibilities, either you're above or below. And then so the, the business is gonna adjust, right? Or the supply side is gonna adjust. All right. So now let's look at this practice question. <laughs> Suppose Outlandia economy is operating at point B at here. A, is this the income expenditure equilibrium for Outlandia? Describe what is happening to inventory and production in Outlandia if we are at B. At B, what happened? There's a shortage because the expenditure is exceed the supply. You already see the year GDP, right? Very good. And then, so what's happening to inventory? You have a positive inventory investment or a negative inventory investment. So that's key. Do you see a positive or negative? So again, inventory investment is a, is a change in the inventory. Is positive or negative? Do we have other opinions? So what is positive? So, so here, so essentially it says what? So you have more demand than you produce. Then your inventory is going to run in low or run in high? It's going to run in low. And then they can compare before, so you're lower. So then, so remember, so inventory investment is a change in inventory. If you're running low, it must be a negative number. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the inventory investment is going to be negative, right? Because they're running low. Is the number. So you have, you used to have 10 cars in your drive. Now the, the demand is so high. Not so high, you end up with eight economy at the end of the period. So it's a negative two. 
That makes sense. Okay. And then, so what's happening to inventory and practice? So now, what are the interaction next? The, so the other part are more, right? Okay, so this is uh, part A. Now, part B, what level of GDP will this economy produce at the equilibrium? What level? Part B, what level of GDP will this economy produce at equilibrium? Y2, thank you, and C, right? So this was the chart. No supply, everything goes at plan. Now C, at what level of GDP on plan investment is possible? What that means, that just means you are getting more than more inventory. Which point? You have positive inventory investment. D. D. Very good. So actually, so there are more than these. So to, to be precise, any point to the right of C, you can have positive. But well, your answer is correct. Okay. So because any point on the right hand side of C, so you produce more than you plan to spend. I suppose, I mean, I agree with probably. And now D, at what level is planned accurate expenditure greater than income? The essential is any point towards never have a seat. Right. Okay. Any question? <clears throat> so this is answer. And then you can just read yourself if you have any questions. All right. So now we understand what equilibrium looks like. But then so we are going to look at if there's any like disturbance or there's an adjustment. Because again, so in, in, in reality. The GDP is not, it's not a constant, right? So what happens when there's a shift in plant aggregate spending line? But the first, okay, what can cause the shift? So usually, so for now, so we talked about two possible causes. One is change in interest rate. The other is changing wealth. The so both is gonna have impact on demand side, on demand side. So the interest rate is going to matter to investment. Okay. And actually, the interest rate also is going to matter to your saving and consumption. Well, certainly has an impact on consumption. All right. All right. Uh, I guess you know, this slide is a little bit awkward. So this is kind of what we already discussed. Right, so the plan in plan spend doesn't equal output, it should all be in change to inventory. But this uh, this explains why inventory is considered as a leading indicator to understand the direction of our future economic activity. Um now let's see multiplier. Okay, so this is not the first time we see multiplier, and this is also not the last time we see multiplier. Okay, how we understand the multiplier? The first two column. The first two column. If you look at the first two column, we know the equilibrium is here. Now we add a third column. Okay. So what is third column? If we compare second with third column, Clearly, there's something change in terms of aggregate expenditure, plan aggregate expenditure. But what is changing? What caused the change? So that we move from second to third column. Can you see the difference between second and third column? Second uh you was just, you were thinking about the cost right i want to want to tell you i was trying to ask you what you saw i mean what like kind of like similar what, what pattern what not the cause of this change i just want to see so what a change you saw oh the increase right okay yeah right right 
So the increase, increase by how much? 400 actually was written on the top, right, okay. But to be precise, from the second to the third column, essentially, so you have, the, so y equal to a plus mpc times y plus i. And then, so in the second column, so a equal to 800. And the third column, a equal to 1200. So the autonomous spending is different. Or in other words, if you just draw a line, so this aggregate expansion line move up parallelly by 400. All right, so that just says, okay, for any level of income, so the aggregate expenditure is gonna increase by 400. But the interesting thing is, if you look at the equilibrium, because now you're gonna look at first and the third column, the equilibrium increased by more than 400. Okay? So this is what we call multiplier. But before I explain to you the, the economic reason behind that, can you just try to guess what happens? Let me write down first. So the autonomous spending increase by 400. But end always, the total GDP increase by 1,000. And we call this multiplier. What is behind this multiplier? For certain things, so we need to understand so what called this change, but this is not relevant. So she has a point, says maybe there's an interest rate change. Let's just forget about that. Okay, so say so but there's some reason to bring up this aggregate expansion line. But for now, we want to try to understand so why so this line increased by 400. But then suddenly the GDP increased by more than 400. The title should give you a hint. The title of the multiplier. Anyone? I'm sorry? Leftover uh, there, there hasn't much to do with the inventory. So again, so we need, we need to look forward a little bit. So forget about this adjustment from one line to the other line. Just focus on, so you move from this number to this number, from 2,000 to 3,000. And the starting point is everyone decides to spend 400 more. Okay, so let me give you the explanation. <sighs> So remember, so earlier we talked about a multiplier. There's a chain rule, right? There's a chain rule. So if I, if either one of us in this economy spend 400 more for any income we have, but this 400 additional spending is going to become income of somebody else. So there's going to have a chain rule, the same logic, all right? So then, so the total economy is going to increase by more than 400. Okay. So this problem is going to be better to see from this, this uh, diagram. So this is where we start. Now this line move up by 400. But I see, so the equilibrium is going to increase by more than 400. It's more than 400 because there's a multiplier. There's a multiplier. Right. So again, so where's the multiplier? Essentially, essentially just what? So everyone are intrinsically connected. I spend 400, but this 400 becomes somebody else's income. And then it's somebody else. So yeah, they start with 400 more, but on top of that, because it's somebody else have additional income. And then, so it's gonna spend more and, then, and so on and so forth. Right, and certainly, certainly the gap, I mean, this horizontal gap, this horizontal gap is going to 
largely depending on the slope, right? Just image, just image. If this slope getting flatter, if this curve getting flatter, just picture this in your in your in your mind, okay? In your brain. If this getting flatter, what happened to the horizontal increase? Is it getting larger or smaller? Can you see that? It's getting larger or getting smaller. <coughs> Just imagine if it's extreme case, the so multiplier equal to zero. And then so this line becomes a straight the horizontal line, no? Now, if that's the case, that's exactly equal to 400. Are you with me? Are you, are you guys with me or no? So you see, so the flatter the curve, the smaller the horizontal increase, but it's also intuitive, right? If this goes to zero, I mean, the slope getting zero means what? You don't spend, you don't spend <clears throat> additional penny earned. There's no multiplier. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Right, so now we go back to the paradox of thrifting, actually just link with here because of the multiplier. From your point of view, I mean, from individual point of view, it is rational for you to, for you tighten your belt to reduce the consumption when the recession fear is looming. But this is going to have a multiplier effect because we are connected. So in the end, so you're going to, collectively reduce the <clears throat> GDP and reduce the income, reduce the expenditure. Right, so this is the, this is the paradox of thrifty we mentioned early. Okay. Now let's look at the multiplier <clears throat> in reality. <clears throat> Here we, we zoom in 2020, uh, sorry, 2001. There's like a short period of the recession in 2001. Does anyone know what is the cause of this recession? Or does anyone know what happens in 2001? Nine eleven. Nine eleven. that's one of the causes <clears throat> of this recession. Like look here. So that's uh, the third quarter of uh, 9-11, right? So how we tell there's a re <clears throat> there's a recession. <clears throat> you can see the GDP drop, right? So this is real value. So the GDP drop drop by more close to fifty billion. Get this GDP drop. Consumption, like we said earlier, right? So it's kind of doesn't fluctuate much, but if you look at inventory, inventory goes down, right? Okay, but the interesting part is, interesting part is what happened in the quarter of two thousand four fourth quarter of 2001. Like I said, the recession was very shallow. And then in 2001, sorry, the fourth quarter of 2001, the consumer spending surprised the market. It went up very dramatically. Okay, but certainly, so this gap, this gap reflects by here, right? Do you understand that? Let me just erase here just to make sure I understand. So look at the fourth quarter of 2001. Okay, so this is real GDP increased a little bit, but the consumption increased more than that. And then this gap largely reflects the shortage inventory round low, right? But then the economy is going to, I mean, the economy response in the next quarter, see? So because there's a negative inventory and then next period, so the economy start to produce more. Right, so that's why I say, we say the inventory is a leading indicator. If you're running at a very low inventory, usually, so there's a sign, the economy is expanding, <clears throat> right? 
Okay, so I'm going to finish this lecture by looking at this case study. So if you look at 2009, so everyone understand what happened in 2009, right? So the US economy is in a very deep recession, right? It's a very deep recession. And if we look at a particular company, it's called G GM, General Motor, right? And then there's a question, so we need to ask, we need to ask. Does it make sense for the government to bail out a GM? So now we understand what bailout means, right? So actually, so right now, so there's a discussion about building out the Silicon Valley Bank, right? So sometimes we call that too big to fail. What that means? It just means, so the company is so large, it fails, it's gonna have a collateral damage to our economy, right? But then there are two things we need to understand. Number one, what kind of collateral damage? Let's look at the case of GM. What's the collateral damage? Or what does too big to fail means, number one. Number two, and for the case of GM, we also need to think about, so this is written in the, <clears throat> in the, in, in the slide. Was GM's problem self-made or was it a victim of a poor economy? Let's start with the first one. What does too big to fail mean? Or what's the collateral damage this company is going to have if we let the company to fail? What do you think? Is the question clear? So GM is a huge company. I don't know how much they have, how much employees they have, probably like a million or close to that, right? So if we let that company fail, what is gonna be the collateral damage? Our employment is gonna increase. And then we just talk about uh, the multiplier. And this unemployment is gonna spill over to other to the sector. It's gonna make the, it's gonna make the, the, the recession even deeper. So the usually that's what we call the collateral damage. So the company is so big, so they're so connected to, yeah, right. So not only uh, unemployment, and on the other hand, because this company is connected to so many part of our economy, because they have so many supplier or so many other manufacturers connect with this company. If this company fail, then so you're gonna have a cascading with it, um, the broader economy. Does that make sense? Are you guys with me? Right, so this is what, what it means to be to fail. So that's why then the government decided to rescue, rescue this big company, right? So there are like two reasons as we just mentioned, to summarize. Number one, immediately they're gonna lay off a huge amount of worker. And right? then because the modifier is gonna affect if they brought uh, broader company. Number two, because GM, other parts or like uh, chips from other sector. If this company fails, and then so it's going to affect many other sector, right? So this is too big to fail. But certainly too big to fail, and a bailout has some very negative impact. Why if 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 every business understands, so whenever I fail, the government's going to rescue me. How would that change their behavior? Risk. You're going to take more risk. Like in the cost, if you know, so in the end, so I'm going to give you extra credit. I'm going to rescue you. You're probably not going to come across. It, does that make sense? Okay, so now the other question is, <clears throat> so were GM's promise self-made or it was a victim of a poor economy? So to, to fully understand that, so probably you need to go back a little bit to history, right? So regarding to the, the car industry, we don't have the time to discuss that. Now let's just focus on one aspect, more relevant to us. <clears throat> if we look at the car sales in the time period of 2007 and 2008, there's a huge collapse. This is like a drop more than 50%. By looking at this one, 
there are two questions I want to ask you. I want to ask you. Number one, what is behind this collapse? Number two, number two, so based on this part of the of the data, what would your opinion regarding to this question? Let's start with a simple one. What is behind this collapse? Why the car still declined by more than 50 percent? Again, so the backdrop of this uh, of the of this graph was in 2007. There's a collapse in the housing market. The unemployment rate went down to 10 percent. Just ask yourself: Do you want to buy a car at that point or no? So that explains the the, the shock decline. Right. So this shock decline is is totally independent of the GM management. Regardless of how good is their car, because people lost their will, they don't want to spend it, right? So in that sense, and it's partly so the GM problem is not self-made. It is kind of a victim of poor economy because the broader demand collapsed. That kind of, kind of what? Kind of, in that sense, GM's problem is kind of like a collateral damage, you know, the broader economy. Right. But certainly, if you look at the, the car industry, so the, the this like a big um, American car company, they didn't keep up with the competition in the 1980s and 1990s. The competition coming from Japanese and uh, South Korean car maker. Right. So we don't have time or surprise, there's too much distraction for us to understand the macro economy. Anyway, to summarize here, so this another example shows us. So the economy is like intrinsically connected, right? So there's like a multiplier. In the case of GM, so the broader economy is kind of collapsing. And then, so they are, they are part of the collateral damage. On the other hand, so if the government stay away or just take a hands off approach, then we are gonna make the decision, uh, sorry, the recession even deeper. That's actually happened in 1929. Because back then, so the government take a different approach. But certainly there's a very delicate balance. In the sense, if, you, if the government step in or intervene too much, we end up with other scenario, which is what happened in 2020, 2021. Because now we, have, we are having an inflation, right? This is partly because the government kind of like intervene too much.